Well, good, good uh, morning. Um, welcome to this uh, session on data dominance. I'm Ricardo Hausmann. I'm a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School and the director of the Harvard Center for International Development. I am very, very pleased to um, uh, chair, uh, to moderate this session where uh, we're going to have a discussion on an issue that has been uh, quite central uh, to the whole meeting. As you know, we're discussing the social, the political, the economic, the business consequences of the fourth industrial revolution. <clears throat> One of the things that characterizes this uh, revolution is that it allows for the uh, transmission, creation, processing, analyzing of data. It allows to create uh, a new set of products that allows to organize production in different ways, uh, that allows to uh, um, market things in different ways, that allows to uh, conceive of, of, of things in very different ways. Uh, this data revolution is happening at a pace that we're going to learn and find out about. Uh, the data is being accumulated at uh, dramatic rates but the data accumulation is not necessarily accessible uh, to everybody or to many people. In some sense, it's being accumulated in very, very few players. And that probably has implications, both for business and for countries and for international affairs. So we're going to be exploring some of these issues uh, to uh, have us discuss these issues. We have a fantastic panel. Uh, we will start with Neri Woods. Neri is the dean of the Blavatnik School uh, of um, um, Government. So um, she's my competitor. <laughs> <laughs> so the Blavatnik School is, is um, Oxford's um, uh, equivalent of the Kennedy School of Government. So that's why I say she's my competitor. Um, uh, we will have. Uh, Jumoki Adekeye, uh, who's a global shaper, and we've seen the global shaper's impact on all the panels and so on, and she's going to give us a perspective uh, coming from developing countries, coming from the South, coming from the young, uh, and, um, and she's, um, uh, she's a, a recognized entrepreneur, uh, empowerer of the young and their ability to join in the fourth industrial revolution and a, a, a force in healthcare. So, um, and finally, we have uh, Mr. Mats uh, Granrid, who's the director general of GSMA, which is an association of the telecom industry and the data heavy uh, companies uh, um, of the world, uh, where they discuss issues of uh, business policy, public policy standards, and so on. So, so it's a fantastic group of people with whom to, to have this discussion. We will start with a presentation by Neri where she's going to lay out what the facts are. And um, after that, we'll, we'll start our discussion. Please, Great. Neri. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think what I'd like to do is start by taking you, because we're talking about technology today, um, several thousand years before Christ. So. It's all right, I'm not going to take you in real time through history since then. But I'm going to take you just into the world of the archaeologist, the ar an archaeologist in Oxford, Amy Bogart, whose work reveals that when human beings had to farm with their own hands, they lived in very equal societies. And we can see that because their dwellings were all of the same size, clustered together. And then you saw the invention of a new technology, the plow quite a simple technology. Think about the plow. The plow hugely helps if you're a farmer, ease the back-breaking work of farming. But at the same time, the plow divided those ancient societies into those who could afford to buy a plow, who somehow acquired the means to buy a plow, and therefore became much more productive than their neighbors, who quite quickly became the people who worked for them. And so you saw the advent of inequality. And you can see this in archaeological sites, where suddenly there are little houses, and then there are bigger houses next to them. And interestingly, the bigger houses 
start hiding their seed grains to hide their wealth because they're still living with the poor in their community. And then you fast forward another few hundred years, a blink of a second for an archaeologist, and you discover that the people that started out with plows have now become so much more wealthy that they now build their dwellings far away from the poor, and instead of hiding their grain cellars, they build them grandly to compete with each other on who's got the finest looking house because they're safely away from the envy of the people who are still working the fields. Now, why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that just to highlight right from the outset that technological advances have this fantastic, empowering possibility of making life easier and more productive. And at the same time, every single technology has also got this power to create huge inequality and a distribution problem. And that's what we've got to, we've got to look at these two things as we look at the world of data and, and how technology is affecting communities. So the first thing I want to just point out to you, and all of you know it, is the divide between those who are connected and those who aren't. Internet users in pink, the non-users in blue. That's what some people call the data divide or the digital divide. And what's notable about it is that twice as many of the people who aren't connected are women, and four times as many are people that haven't had educations. Okay, so that's, that's the divide that we're talking about today. But the good news is that 80% of people around the world are within range of a 3G connection. I found that surprising. So this work is coming out of a project called the Pathways for Prosperity Commission, supported by the Gates Foundation and based in the Blavatnik School of Government. And that and what we're looking for, what is the positive pathway that we can track through these, the adoption of these technologies? And of course, one of the things that we're up against all the time is what's called the kind of techno-hysteria, particularly around jobs. So here we see it. These are the different reports that have come out telling us what percentage of jobs are going to be lost due to technology. So, and you can see there's a sort of relatively calming effect for our OECD colleague, and 9% over here going to 60% um, hysteria. I would say, after two days of Davos this year, that there's an equal and opposite slide, which is techno-fantasy, which is whiz-bang apps going to solve all of this problem. Technology will solve all of these problems. And I think in this room, you know, we're a group of, you are a group of experts that know that neither of those things is right. And what we actually have to do is start crafting exactly which pathways are going to manage um, this technology. Note that the world hasn't been on a single trajectory since 4,000 years before Christ, right? That inequality did not simply keep growing. There isn't one most wealthy person in the world and then everybody else. There's been a whole process as each technology has been adopted by human beings of regulating, of refereeing, of redistributing. And one of the things that hugely helps that are costs of technology. So here, the Pathways Commission has, has looked at how rapidly the cost of digital inclusion is falling. So this is a positive story. Those people that couldn't afford plows when plows began, became cheaper could start buying plows and, and competing or building them and competing. And so too, in the digital divide, we can see it's getting cheaper and therefore more possible. And then finally, what is it that governments need to do and what is it that societies need to do in order to be able to harness this? So the Pathways Commission is looking across the developing world, particularly at low-income countries, and saying, where are the positive possibilities? What is it that we're seeing? Where are the pathways for prosperity that we're noticing? And these, and my panelists are um, more expert than me and can go through them, but the first is unleashing value in agriculture. After 30 years of debate of how do we build canning factories, suddenly we've got new opportunities for linking farmers to markets. Um, Twigger, you probably know about, in Kenya, that's linking some 8,000 uh, farmers in that country to 5,000 buyers and giving them ways to start improving the value of what they're already doing. New global value chains. You know, 
not just connecting across the informal economy, but the capacity to maintain machines from a distance, the capacity to adopt technologies even without a dense network in place. The fourth, global trade and services. And, you know, in the Philippines, you've got call centers where the work that that young woman in the call center is doing is actually upskilling. So there's a pathway to prosperity for those individuals which the technologies are opening up. And which is building new global value chains and ways that we can actually harness these technologies. Let me finish just with a word about the political challenge. Some of you will have read Yuval Hariri's latest foreign affairs um, article where he depicts a world where data is the new mineable resource and points out that this could be the no, new colonialism, that developing countries are data rich, and yet there's only two countries in the world, China and the United States, that have really built the capacity to dominate in the analysis and use of data. So he depicts a world for us where they become the new colonialists, mining data in developing countries, processing it, in those two competing superpowers and passing it back. He puts to us the challenge, very much as the post-colonial challenge was, for Europe, for other countries in the system, for developing countries and Europeans, to think about how they will empower countries and empower themselves to ensure that that's not the world that emerges. So that in Davos in five years' time, when we're sitting in this room, we're not talking about a new colonialism but we are talking about harnessing technologies so that the, the poorest in the world have pathways for prosperity. And that's, I think, what this panel is going to do today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, well, let's, uh, uh, let's move now on to um, Jumoke Adekeye. Uh, and uh, Jumoke, you've been uh, uh, trying to um, connect the young uh, to the new opportunities uh, in this new digital age. Uh, there is the perception, you know, when we talk about digital divide, it means that some people are being left behind. When we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, there is this pessimism about jobs. And your experience is the new technological changes uh, a source of opportunity for the South, for the young. Is it a challenge? What's the balance? Are you, uh, and, and how does that guide your, your, your own actions? Thank you for that question. Um, I think it's, it's quite complex, um, but I'll try to tackle it from a few angles. Um, one is that it is true that there is definitely opportunity um, with digital inclusion. Specifically, when we look at opportunities that are being created because you have digital platforms that enable um, quite a number of people to access work. Now, whether it is for those who are skilled in, in coding or programming, they're able to outsource their, you know, do some work and um, not just within the borders of, of their country, but outside um, the country. Or if we look at tax hailing apps, that you see opportunities for people um, in urban areas um, who now have um, an opportunity to uh, make some extra change, so to speak. Um, so there is, there is something to be said for opportunity, new job opportunities that could potentially be created. However, the National Bureau of Statistics in Nigeria published a report um, in November 2018 showing our um, unemployment rates at record highs um, at 23.1%. What that means is that even though we've had some penetration of um, digital jobs, so to speak, right? So you have the likes of the Uber and Taxify, um, you have um, a few other uh, companies that are training young people to access jobs through, you know, by um, teaching them how to code and program. It has not made a dent on the unemployment rates. Um, I think what I want to highlight as well is that even though the, the, the opportunities we're seeing are not opportunities for full-time employment, it is, uh, if we can say, the gig economy. It's part-time employment, and and in the con in the the context of countries like Nigeria, it's that a lot of young people are looking to be able to make enough money to 
perhaps you know have a to pay the rent uh, but these opportunities these jobs are not um, paying enough to be able to do that um, so there's there's that angle of so there's on the one hand there is um, opportunity the opportunities have not really made a dent on um, an unemployment rate so and they're also concentrated they generally are concentrated in the urban areas right mm -hmm. so you were speaking to the urban rural uh, divide well the digital divide and I, I would say that it's it's even more pronounced when you start looking at those living in urban versus rural areas um, in terms of uh, what I do to try to um, connect young people to, to job opportunities definitely one of the areas we look at is improving their digital literacy skills um, and so some of the work that we're doing is helping uh, young people who've come out of um, in, in a lot of cases a, a broken um, educational system um, that pumps out graduates um, like a factory line but they are unable to work with spreadsheets um, word processing um, and so we start at the very basic now if we start to think of the fourth um, industrial revolution and um, we start to think about artifi um, artificial intelligence I mean we're definitely going beyond these basics but I mean that's a start so I think that um, I'll say, I think I'll say one more thing. I think I, start, I started to talk about a broken education system. I don't think it's um, just, um, how shall I say, uh, um, it's not, it's not a, a situation that is um, particular to perhaps sub-Saharan Africa or other emerging economies. There's, I think across the globe we're seeing young people also beginning to say that their education um, is not necessarily preparing them for the future, not necessarily preparing them for the future of work. Um, and so I think that's a concern that we need to um, look at. Um, so yes, you may have sound basic education, but then how, does, how, does, how do those skills then translate to the workforce and then to the workforce of the future? Thank you. Thank you. Um, 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 Mr. Grant. Yes. Um, uh, you know, we've been talking about the digital divide for a long time, but and the truth is <clears throat> that cell phone technology is probably uh, the technology that has spread the fastest across the world. And, uh, you know, these days there's something like 80% penetration of cell phones in Kenya. There's something like 28% uh, penetration of electricity. And that's not because electricity is a new technology that hasn't had time yet to spread, right? Um, it's it's uh, the other way around. It's in spite of the fact that it's much newer, it has diffused much faster. Um, uh, but it's good that we focus on the digital divide because that will <coughs> imply that we'll adopt policies that will make diffusion even faster. But um, uh, and that has enabled many things out there, but, but the new things that are happening are happening through the use of data. Mm. Uh, once upon a time, uh, there was a lot of data in telephone companies. And the data was being accumulated in telephone companies and we would, uh, at my center, we would have alliances with cell phone operators for them to share the data for us to do all kinds of analysis in terms of social networks, mobility, and so on with cell phone data. Uh, these days, people call through WhatsApp. Cell phone companies don't have inf access to that information. Information is, WhatsApp is owned, I think, by Facebook. And so uh, Facebook gets all your, all your information through when you use Facebook and when you use WhatsApp and so on. And you have not, you know, Neri was talking about uh, the US and China as being, you know, uh, data superpowers. But it's, it's not the US and China, it's Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix. It's, it's, so it's, it's, it's particular companies that happen to be housed in, 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 in those places. So um, uh, as, as you think of the challenges of the telecom industry, uh, how, how are data, uh, uh, is, is data being now reconcentrated even within that industry? Uh, that, that the process of inequality in data acquisition is not just between countries, but between companies that are even in, in your own network? Is, is, is the issue of, uh, say, access to the data that these giants are going to have and the possibility of producing products, designing apps, designing mm. 
APIs designing things that use that data, is that restricting business opportunities? Is it concentrating the future deployment of technology in very few firms? Or, uh, or there's so much green fields out there to be exploited that we shouldn't worry about that? Wow, well, I, now I know why I never went to Harvard. <laughs> too, too complicated and too many questions in, in one question. But I, but I, I think you're right. I, you know, maybe I should just start with saying that it is a phenomenal technology. If you go back 20 years, do you know how many people owned a mobile phone 20 years ago? And not even 5%, maybe 3 4% of the world's population. Today, we connect through the mobile networks more than two-thirds of everyone. So it's, it's more than 5.1 billion people. So it is an awesome platform. Um, in the beginning, in the 2G era, it was all about connecting you and me. It was all about becoming mobile. Um, pretty soon, though, we moved into technologies, like you said, 3G and now onto 4G, and pretty soon 5G. It is all about internet. It's all about accessing uh, applications on the internet. Uh, and we have just, just now passed 50% of the world's population that are accessing internet, and predominantly through a device like this. So there is another three and a half billion, what you short showed show there, that is not connected to the internet. And of course, the business model has completely changed in this new world of data. We started with connecting, as I said, people, and now we're moving into a new world of data. Um, uh, the business model of the new companies, the US-based and the Chinese-based, you forgot to mention Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu, which are powerhouses in, in, in China. And then you have the fangs in the US with Google, Apple, and Facebook, etc. Their business model is all about mining your data. And when we leave the cellular network, when we move into a Wi-Fi world, our visibility of the data disappears. And it goes solely to these internet companies, you can say. So the business model is different. We provide a service. The service is connectivity. Their, their service, the, the OTTs as we call them, the over the top players, their business model is to mine that data, <coughs> refine that data, and resell it back to you, in a way. So that's two completely different business models. And this is something that we in, the, in, in my industry, be, I've been in telecom all my life basically, have been discussing for a long time. And it has been a fairly fierce fight, I would say. Uh, over the past maybe three years, we have sort of come to terms that both sides have to coexist, and we do enjoy our, our company these days. It's better. Mm -hmm. It is better than what it has been before. But it is a uncharted territory. Uh, the data mining industry, if I may say so, has a plethora of different questions on security, on who actually owns the data, where is the data located, but that's uh, something we can talk about maybe in a little while. Mm -hmm. Okay. Neri, you worried about uh, the, the new colonialism, the post-colonialism, and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, I can imagine that there are different uh, policy concerns, right? Um, for example, Apple has the App Store, mm -hmm. but the App Store is open. Mm -hmm. So anybody can, can produce an app and put it in the App Store, and they benefit from the fact that Apple is a global platform. Mm -hmm. But uh, Facebook might have you know, a lot of information about your likes, your preferences, your friends, your social networks, your whatever, uh, but not necessarily everybody has access to that information to produce value added with it and, and so on. So one issue is, is access, should we guarantee access to information so that people can add value so that mining becomes a more open game? Mm -hmm. That's one dimension, and the other dimension, I think, has to do with taxation, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, you know these global companies uh, pay taxes where they mine everywhere. Uh, what do countries? So what, what is the benefit to countries of of having this data? So um, is it a question of access to data? Is it a question of mm -hmm. sharing on the revenues, etc.? Yeah. Um, 
you know, it's almost a choice. Do I want to live in a world as depicted by George Orwell of the Big Brother State, or do I want to live in the world depicted by Aldous Huxley? You know, do, do I want to live in a world... The, the world seems to be gravitating, as you say, towards two choices. One, where the government has all the information, all the data, and can use it to start incentivizing population or controlling the population in different ways, and the other in which private sector firms have all the data and in a way could hold the rest of us hostage in a different way. And those are really very real concerns. We know, you know, there's a, there's a whole debate around um, China's social credit model and what that means about the relationship between government and citizen in terms of information, but equally the debate that we should be having about in the United States, the privatization, even of publicly collected data. So Michael Lewis's book, The Fifth Risk, highlights the way that data, weather data collected at American taxpayers' expense with public money is now, you know, there are very, very strong efforts, um, including by uh, President Trump's appointee to run the weather service, to privatize it. In other words, to, f to, to permit one company or a couple of companies now that's important because if data is the new oil, you want to encourage entrepreneurship. You want to encourage many creative users of that data. So to me, the third option is to really take seriously what open data architecture looks like and to think about how do we do that. Maybe Europe needs to carve that out and think very seriously about what that means. Governments have lots of reasons not to want to do open data, or as my colleague Nigel Shadbot puts it, reasons for data hugging, right? But actually they are surmountable, and I think if we're going to manage this digital divide, the data divide, in a way that really opens up opportunities for people, we have to actually think about the architecture of data. Very good. So, uh, so you, want, uh, you want sort of more, more open owner access to data so that uh, whoever has a way to cr create more value with it has the opportunity to do it. That's right. I think that, that both in democracies and non-democracies at, at the moment, we're seeing a roar of anger, yeah. frankly, whether it's through elections or demonstrations. And that roar of anger yeah. is about the government not playing referee adequately. Data is the thing we really need governments yeah. to play referee on, not to put yeah. it in the hands of particular private actors not to hold it themselves to use it as an instrument of coercion, but to really create an open data architecture that permits all of society to benefit in different ways. May I um, sure. interject here? I'm looking at data. I mean, Aniri, you've mentioned data is the new oil. I recognize it's the currency of the future. But another perspective is if we start seeing data, because data about human beings as a piece of um, about information about uh, human beings, which in that case, it should be owned by individuals, right? So um, what if we were to envision a world where I have control over the data that's collected or I have access to my data that's um, available on different platforms and I can decide whether or not it gets used um, or not, right? So oh. as opposed to, right, so as opposed yeah. to, I mean, because I, I, I hear you on uh, the the, the options that we have now, which is you know government versus companies, but there is, if we're looking ahead, um, there is something to be said for recognizing um, data as a human right, data as information about individuals, about human beings, um, not just you know, I mean about our movements and I guess so. My, I guess my submission is that um, perhaps we should start when we start thinking about. Um, data governance, start recognizing that we're collecting data on human beings and they should have access to their information and, and perhaps start treating it as such. And so perhaps we'll be, uh, you know, less inclined to uh, have um, a discussion just on what, what the government is doing or what companies can do for their own, um, you know, financial benefit. Yeah. I, look, I agree, but, but the reason I mentioned Aldous Huxley is because every single one of us in this room has been seduced into giving up that right for convenience. Every single one of us. So you might have turned off location services on your mobile phone until you got to Davos and needed to use Google Maps. We've all actually, we're, we're just giving that away for our own convenience. And I don't think 
telling people, no, 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 hold on to it, like do everything in an inconvenient way is going to work. I mean, I have two teenage children. I, I, I don't think I can make it work with them, let alone with an entire population. Right. I, I, I hear you. I think what, what I'm, and I, I, I hear you on the reality that we're facing today. I guess what I'm saying is that as we construct, think about um, responsible data use, mm -hmm. as we begin to think about um, governance of data, artificial intelligence, I guess that's where I'm going because what feeds artificial intelligence is data. And so if we start looking ahead and say, yes, right now it's, uh, we can think about the use of data for financial benefit, but then there's and so many things, so many applications when we start thinking of artificial mm -hmm. intelligence that our data could be used mm -hmm. for. Um, and so I guess what I'm just advocating is that as whatever the, the structures of, of, um, that will be set up, um, whether it's you know, within uh, GSMA or um, between uh, governments, partnerships with, with private sector, to start thinking ahead and start thinking about these issues and recognizing that, yes, the convenience of today, we're giving up things, yeah. but um, the, the reality is our legislation, uh, our, um, the commitments, uh, discussions we're having are not catching up to our reality, mm. what, our, what data, mm. our data can be used. I mean, so my, my, can can we imagine a competitor to Facebook that actually pays people for their data? and therefore eviscerates all the competition. No, but you're, you're absolutely... Are we going to go that way? No, absolutely, and you're absolutely right. It is, it is weird, right, that we are actually fueling them with our stuff, mm -hmm. and then they refine it, and then they sell it back to me. So there are several operators globally that are working with the, pretty much what you, what you said, that the data that I generate on the Internet is my data. It is mine. Mm -hmm. And I can decide to sell it or to keep it, and when I want to switch from one provider to another provider, it's called the platform neutrality. I can take that data from Facebook or whatever and move it over to Tencent or move it over to some other platform. And then it is gone from the first place because it's my data. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a good notion to have mm -hmm. because we will always be used, as you rightly said. I mean, it's completely impossible not to, to uh, leave a digital footprint today. And it's going to be even worse tomorrow when we're entering to the thing we call intelligent connectivity, which is the combination of 5G and IoT, which gives us a phenomenal connection. Everything will be connected. And we're going to have to pay a premium for stuff that is not connected. You know, you buy a handbag, it's going to be connected. You buy a new toaster, it's going to be connected. That together with artificial intelligence and, and AI intelligent connectivity. We need to work on these issues now before it's too late. But, um, I mean, there is a pecuniary thing, do they pay me, do they not pay me, and that, that, that might be one dimension, but, but that's not what people are mostly scared about, right? They're mostly scared about the end of their privacy, the uh, other things. So what are, are the other dimensions in which um, a, you know, public policy should do something about, about it. Uh, ownership, I mean, my data uh, is not particularly useful to me. If, say, if I'm in a matching, looking for a girlfriend or something, right? My data is, is not very valuable. It's everybody else's data that uh, they're going to match my data with that adds the value to my data. My data on its own is, 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 not, is not useful to me. It's, it's the mixing of my data with other people's data. So I can take it out, I renounce using Google Maps. I give it in, what, what, is, what is that policy should protect me from? Well, look, I, I sit as dean of a school of government, so the bit that I would answer on is about the relationship between government and citizens. Mm -hmm. And what does liberty mean in the, in the 21st century? Over the last two centuries, humans really worked hard to prevent the queen summarily beheading them, right? To prevent um, excesses of executive power. And those excesses could now come out in data. So what are the models that we have? So Estonia has a model that says, okay, yes, we have all the data, but every single time anyone in government accesses your data, you get an email telling you that they've accessed your data. And you can check that they had a good reason for accessing it. So it's to say, yes, Actually, we do need it for the convenience, but we also need to keep you completely informed about how it's being used. And that is obviously what the big social media companies have manifestly failed to do. They have misinformed us 
at every turn about what they're yeah. actually doing with our data. Oh, but that, that's one thing, sorry, mm -hmm. but that's one thing. The other thing is big data. I mean, it's, it's not only to, for convenience, but it can actually help us. It helps us tremendously. In India, for instance, with the tuberculosis, we can overlay uh, affected areas and we can see movement patterns of individuals and see where the next possible outbreak will be, and we can prevent those things. We can do uh, air pollution studies in Sao Paulo. We can predict air quality up to two days before it happens and, and being, you know, allowing the, the government to, to protect the, the public health. So big data is something phenomenal and it's something that we have to be able to use. So I would come from a little bit of a different mm -hmm. angle. You mm -hmm. come from the government, I come from the industry side. Mm -hmm. And I would say that it's all about rebuilding trust. Mm -hmm. We do not trust mm -hmm. uh, industry. We do not trust governments. We don't trust politicians these days. If you see the last year's Edelman's trust barometer, it's plummeted straight down into the toilet. And, and, and I, I think that business leaders st are still enjoying a little bit better trust, not much, but a little mm -hmm. bit better trust, that business leaders that have a, a um, right intention needs to sign up to a, a declaration to say, you know what, we're going to treat data with the utmost respect. We're going to protect your data against cybersecurity threats. Uh, we're going to make sure that it's inclusive, that it's driving innovation, uh, uh, and, uh, and so forth. So creating this North Star, if you would like, this is yeah. where we're heading. So that's very interesting because I was thinking, you know, we, when we think governments, we think national governments. So Google operates in 200 countries. So having national government policies on a platform that 200 countries are participating in is probably going to be grossly ineffective. Uh, so, but then we're talking about a global government trying to impose global rules on things and that also doesn't sound to be like terribly exciting. So uh, is it going to be sort of like uh, corporations being sort of like morally accountable uh, for the things they, that they do and if if they break the trust in the same way the way Facebook did with um, the information about people's uh, uh, preferences that was exploited in the presidential campaign in, in yeah. the US and the UK. Is it, is it this sort of like a moral suasion by the public on corporations that keeps them honest? Or, or do we really think that, um, that there is some enforcement capacity that is going to impose uh, a discipline on them? But we're launching in, in a couple of hours something we call Digital Declaration, uh, which is this North Star. And it's, it's, a, uh, it's an ambition, it's, mm -hmm. it's a grand ambition. We have 45 CEOs signed up to it uh, across industries. It's a global initiative because you're absolutely right, it cannot be in one country nor a continent, it needs to be global. Uh, and it is no way for us to follow up that they are uh, adhering to it, but it is, a sort of creating a baseline, if you would like, mm -hmm. because we don't have a baseline today. And it's creating that baseline that I think is the first starting point. And then Can you give us some intuition of you know, what, what, what's in it? Well, as I said, it is about uh, treating you as, uh, with, with the utmost respect, your data with respect, making sure that it's inclusive, that we are driving innovation, uh, that we are, are securing uh, against as much cyber security threat as possible, that we're transparent, back to the Estonia case, where you actually understand that you need to opt in to different services and making that easy. Because today you can opt in, but it's completely impossible. Or your example of App Store, for instance, if you want to download a, a, uh, an app to be successful, you need to say yes. Otherwise, it's not going to work, right? So, so it is a forced opt-in, you can say. And we need to take that away. We need to make sure that it's easy and it's understandable for individuals. Okay. So I, I urge everyone to go to the sanctuary at uh, 2.30. OK, good. <laughs> I, I think it's security threats that are going to force us to yeah. collaborate, cooperate, and find good solutions. And it's security at a number of different levels. It's not just your personal security, now that your refrigerator and your music system and your Alexa or whatever are pumping back to, in, in hackable ways, pumping out information about whether you're home, whether you're not home, how long you're there for, 
you know, beautiful information for anybody that wants to come and clean out your house or, or do, do whatever else they want to do, right up to the political system. You know, the, the United Nations Charter has, you know, entrenches this idea of political independence, which countries have fought for, the right not to have foreigners invade you, infiltrate your political system. And yet the last two years have shown a complete infiltration of political systems through data and through social media. So I think there are, at the national level and, at the, and then at the international level, right, the, the, the prospect of technological warfare, of being able to take down, of non even state on state, but the idea that groups can hold governments to ransom because they can shut down the hospital system, they can shut down the nuclear power plants. These are very real threats, and every government knows that they are facing these threats, just as every bank in the world knows that they're dealing with cybersecurity threats every day. So I think there's a, that's going to be, you know, that's why these issues are so urgent to forge these multi-stakeholder partnerships around, because actually that's a problem for every single one of us, whether you're making an IoT device, whether you're a, you know, somebody that wants to live securely in your home, or somebody that actually wants to live in a politically independent country. These are issues that are gonna have to be regulated. So for me, it's security that will drive us to cooperation. Jumo, let me go back for a second to, to issues of more how the positive side of all of this technology. I, I was really impacted um, when I went to Indonesia last uh, year that uh, they have this uh, g company called Gojek, uh, which is sort of like the Uber of everything. Uh, and it allows people to use motorcycles for last leg logistics. It allows people to sell their services, massages through uh, you know, Uber kind of thing. In the sense, the information that is being shared is I'm willing to provide a service, somebody's willing to buy that service, it's connecting us, and it's allowing for leapfrogging around you know, other technologies that, that uh, would have made these things impossible to formalize and so on. Do you see in, in your experience in Nigeria, in the young, so like an awareness that there's a whole new set of possibilities that can be exploited and that might generate you know, like new forms of entrepreneurship, new forms of activity that can you know, connect people so that they can, can you know, use their efforts productively. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, speaking of connectivity, uh, these platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, have made the world so much more smaller. So you're seeing that regardless, and you know, and we're also talking about um, the high mobile phone penetration rates, but increasingly with smartphones coming down to less than 50 US dollars, you see that more increasingly, uh, more and more young people are able to um, afford uh, smartphones. I mean, there are other phones that are also being, um, you know, the old phones that are being refurbished and, you know, sold at much cheaper rates. So um, what that means then is that young people have access to information on what's um, going around the world. So they're, um, you know, I, I can talk specifically about global shapers around the world who are connected, you know, to this, to this um, session. Um, they're connected to Davos by live streaming. So they can, a lot of young people um, are, are be increasingly globally aware. They're globally aware, and that also means that they're aware of possibilities. I mean, if we, th we think about um, so the likes of uh, the companies like Uber, you mentioned, you know, it's interesting that you said Gojak was the Uber of everything, right? So we have, comp you know, local uh, start, well, local startups, startups that mimic, um, you know, the other uh, technology-driven um, companies that we're seeing in from Silicon Valley, for instance. Um, it, what, what's quite interesting is to see young people wanting seeing that in other climates or in other geographies, the young people are able to start um, these businesses and they're blowing up, so to speak, they're making billions of dollars. And so they too want to be the next, uh, as some people are saying, the next Mark Zuckerberg. Some people have said the next Mark Zuckerberg will come from um, Sub-Saharan Africa, it could come from Nigeria, it could come from Rwanda or Kenya. Um, so there is, there is this hunger and thirst for a better life. Um, there's this hunger and thirst to um, make it. Um, maybe sometimes it's, we want uh, a microwave success, but we, we want success. 
um, and yeah. in general. I mean, so I don't want to put any stereotypes on young people, but to answer your question directly, mm -hmm. yes. Um, but, but there are barriers. So in some, in some instances, you see where uh, uh, governments uh, can, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to speak diplomatically, yeah, um, can, can uh, slow down um, the rate at which um, technological, technology um, uh, companies, uh, startups can actually, um, you know, make progress. And so we see in some countries where governments do shut down the internet um, to uh, hide their actions or to prevent, um, you know, the spread of um, uh, messages or uh, demonstrations. Um, and so you see this in, in I won't mention any countries, but you see this quite a bit. Um, and so what that means is that, you know, we have cases where governments uh, are trying to use uh, the internet to the advantage, which also disadvantages um, young people because the government has more control. And so you see on a daily basis, every hour that, um, you know, the internet has been shut down, um, businesses that run on the internet, uh, you know, are making losses. So there's yeah. that economic loss to it. Interesting, interesting. So let, let's go now to the audience for Q&As. Um, uh, let me start with you, sir, and then we'll go to you, and then to you, and then to you. Thank you. <clears throat> so Can you present yourself? Yes, my name is Alfred Spector. I'm a computer scientist. Uh, mm. There's some things which I think you talk about that are pretty clear. Mm. So if there's non-private public data like mapping data that a government generates, yeah. it's very easy to disseminate. No one should worry about it. There can be economic policy differences, but it's quite easy. Mm -hmm. Second thing you bring up is can individuals have access to their own data? Mm -hmm. That's also fundamentally easy to do, right? There's no privacy issue with it. Perhaps it affects a business model of a single company, but most companies actually now allow that mm -hmm. in European regulations and just good marketing. I think the issue, uh, Professor Hausman, you kind of mentioned it, I think, or maybe, maybe you did from Verizon, uh, that uh, it's, the sh it's the agglomeration, it's the collection of lots of private data mm -hmm. where this is complex. And I'll give you this example, and maybe you can comment on this specifically, because I think it will shed light. So Google published a paper this summer saying that they could combine GPS data and search log data mm -hmm. and find likely places where food poisoning started in restaurants mm -hmm. and, send and suggest that to public health officials. And they had mm -hmm. a tenfold increase in the likelihood that those public health officials found problems in those restaurants. So that's a pretty good idea, right? That seems pretty valuable. Would you like, and here's the specific question, do you think that Google should provide its search log data, that's six billion searches a day, plus or minus, <laughs> every government in which it operates, mm -hmm. which would include Russia, which would include the United Kingdom and Germany and England and the United States. That would be the notion of making this available to the public. I'm, I'm sure you don't want my search log data made available to everyone else in this room, but perhaps you think it should be made available to the governments. Do you? That's a very good question. So, um, <laughs> um, I wonder if it will have an impact if it were known that it was going to be shared, it might have an impact on porn uh, websites. Um, people might get scared so, of ever searching for it. So it's not, a, it, it's not a theoretical question because in my view, <laughs> that question, my answer is, is no, and here is why. Because we're moving to a world politically where in so many countries, constraints on executive power are being weakened. Right? So what is executive power? Let's not forget. What is the state, the government? It has a monopoly over the legitimate use of force. It can come and lock you up, no matter how wealthy or protected you think you are. That's the power that a government has, to come and lock you up, to deprive you of liberty. Um, that power alone, which we're seeing even across the world's longest standing democracies, we're seeing the constraints on the power of, exec of the executive erode. So for that reason, my answer is beware if you're feeling that it's actually fine to have government have all that data. But you could ask, so what on earth are we doing giving it to a private company that is beginning to contract with government? Like, how naive are we? 
Uh, yeah, so. I, I sort of agree, but I would say yes. <clears throat> I would say if it is anonymized. Mm. It has to be anonymized if it's, uh, I'm not so interested in your data, but I'm interested in the data, if you would like. Uh, but I do think we need to, uh, what I agree with you, I think we, this is one of those things where you need, really need to hurry, hurry very slowly. Mm. Because things will evolve and, and we might see it one way today, we might see it in a different way tomorrow. But I would sort of say, you know, it's, this is big data and that's just one application. There's a zillion other applications that are equally good. The TB1 that I just said or, you know, the, the uh, uh, multi-drug resistant malaria, for instance, is another one of those things that it would be fantastic. We had the Ebola outbreak. We were not able to, to harness that data. If we would have done that, we would have been able to, to, to do a, a better job in, in uh, curtailing mm -hmm. the, so anonymized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, back there, yes. Thank you very much. My name is Shahmar Mofsumov. I'm a CEO of uh, State Oil Fund from Azerbaijan. I was hearing a couple of very uh, interesting thoughts, and I would like to build on that. You said that uh, oil, um, a data is the next oil, but I would argue that it's better than oil because oil will be used only once. <laughs> the data can be used many, many times with many, many different perspectives. From that perspective, it's a very uh, different and very precious commodity. And you also mentioned that uh, it would be good to have everyone to have access to that data because now it's pooled in different places and within government it can be abused, within the private sector it can be abused. Uh, so it would be very good to have a transparent market where the data can be traded. Mm -hmm. But obviously comes the questions of privacy and security. And if we look at uh, the experience, let's say, with uh, securities, you will see that there are ways where it can be regulated. Because for example, if there is some data or information that can affect the price of a, uh, of a stock, it is very seriously regulated by SEC. And that has been, uh, this regulation was not from the day one. It came, it was built on for uh, quite a long time. So how would you look at a global transparent market where all the data can be traded and obviously it has to be seriously regulated because of the privacy, security, and other issues. Thank you. Very good. So what is the market architecture for data? <laughs> what would it be like to have a, um, a situation where, where you know, data is a commodity that can be traded, that can be priced, uh, that people would have access to? We know how many thousands of pages of legislation financial regulation has, what would it look like in, in data? Well, we don't, have an, uh, we don't have a global regulation, so that's going to be a difficult one. Uh, well, we do have global regulations in finance. You know, we have the, ba uh, the Bank for International Settlements in Basel and so on. So, so we've created a, an institutionality for international finance. I think it's a, it's a good insight to start thinking. Yeah. We need to create that then. We need okay, to very, very nice. Um, yes, I'll, I'll go to there. Uh, I, no, yes, no, sorry, sorry. I had or pre created an order before that and I'm, I'm violating my own thing. So continue, go ahead. Right. No, no, she, she, yes, yes. <laughs> Henry Kerr from The Economist magazine. Um, I, I wanted to ask about the data portability uh, suggestion. Mm. I missed the very start of the session, so apologies if you covered this point. Uh, but I've heard it argued that this could have some unexpected downsides. So if you think of uh, markets with large returns to scale and network effects, then people aren't only going to be able to transfer their data away from the incumbent, they're going to be able to transfer the data to the incumbent. So if you think of Facebook's Instagram taking on Snapchat, it would have been easier if there had been a single button to port all the Snapchat data into Instagram. So I just wonder if that's a potential concern that actually uh, if you make data very portable, you're just going to end up with even more agglomeration and even more dominance of the players. Before we go to the answers, I, I want to take four questions from the audience. So, um, I think yours, please, the next one is here. Yes. So, you'll be next, but you go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Nicholas Henke from McKinsey and uh, work a lot on these kind of things. Um, so, I, I, I'm wondering whether data is actually like the new oil or whether it's more like the new water or like water. 
Lots of data is pretty dirty. A lot of data is pretty frozen. And it's kind of, uh, if you want to build a data lake, it's actually a lot of work. You need to build dams and rivers and so on. And um, for example, if you want to really solve uh, the next big questions in medicine, um, it actually would be a lot of work and a lot of people would need to share relatively meaningful and well labeled data before we could actually make a lot of progress, for, for, for example, about human biology. So the question is, on the one side, I think there is a lot of um, focus on privacy and, and, mm. and, and these kind of issues. On the other side, don't we need to also mm. think about uh, more uh, agreements uh, about data sharing, particularly around uh, things like, like medicine and, and other areas? Very good. Let's go here. Uh, my question is slightly different. My name is Diana Carney. I work in, uh, have worked in development a lot. Um, we st the, the, the session was about data dominance, and my concern is that uh, actually we're, th this digital divide will continue, and that the problem is that a lot of the data that's being produced in Africa is extremely dirty, not very useful, people don't have a lot of money to spend, and that we will continue to neglect that. And I was thrilled to see Nairi's uh, examples of, of pathways for development, because I think we haven't talked mm. about that enough mm. in, in this in modern world. But in all these cases, the kind of digital approach could actually make it worse for, for, for the, the global south. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you know, if we've got chatbots doing the, the, the call centers, yeah. we don't need the call centers in the Philippines, for example. So I guess my question is, you know, is there anything you can say about what can happen in developing countries that, can, that they can put the architecture in place that, that can really help them leapfrog and you know, use their data well to, to make that move. And, and, and let's not come back to the, you know, the example of mobile phones in Kenya yeah. has been so yeah. overused. Yeah. Um, but what, what's the next yeah. example of that that we can see? Yeah, yeah very good. And uh, we're going to go to Lady and Hi, Jeannie Virgo with uh, the Nonprofit Internews. And my question is almost exactly the same. It's, it's just that the follow-on, the, the, the next part of the question is, what happens if the 3.5 billion don't get counted? What if their data isn't included? What are the social implications of that? Thank you very much. We are going to, we have three minutes left. Mm -hmm. So you have one minute each. <laughs> so make the best use of it. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> on Diana and Jean's question, that's one I'm going to choose to answer. Um, so the Pathways for Prosperity Commission is looking at uh, two real priorities for government. So one is infrastructure, absolutely crucial. You know, look at what Indonesia is doing in the Palapa Ring. It's, what, 13,000 kilometers of fiber optic cable to start linking them up. That's absolutely crucial. Some governments can't do it on their own. I think the Google IFC partnership to do C-squared in, in, in Kampala and Accra to sell wholesale um, to telecom, uh, you know, band, uh, bandwidth to telcos, you know, that kind of thing is, is a positive kind of step that we can look at and think about how to expand. So I think infrastructure is really crucial. I think thinking about the digital building blocks, so, you know, the Indian case of identity, um, digital identity, and, and, or identity authentication, I should say, and e-payments. So thinking about what role the government has to play in actually creating an ecosystem for these technologies to actually um, provide a springboard. I think um, encouraging... SMEs and encouraging the development of edge of network technologies so that you can actually just store stuff at a hotspot and then you know get to those communities that are that are currently excluded much quicker. Um, I think you know continuing to use messaging, you know the the use of extension services, which you know have been well discussed in Davos, but that's really important. And for governments, it's cut corruption, it's increased speed, it's increased quality. So harnessing those examples that work. But my message, and I think the message from the Pathways for Prosperity Commission is that there are some very practical things that governments can do now to create an ecosystem, and that we need to help them do that so that, so that the technology becomes um, a, an, an instrument of increasing prosperity and equality in their countries. Thank you. Jumoke. Yes, so I think something that we haven't quite discussed but was raised by the last question about uh, what if the 3.5 billion are not included is uh, data bias. Um, and so the reality is that, yes, you know, when we, we have, um, there's, there's 
currently data bias in terms of data that we use for artificial intelligence. Uh, I learned that um, some of the algorithms for Facebook still recognize Serena, uh, recognize Serena Williams and Michelle Obama as male as opposed to female. Um, so there's racial bias and some gender bias as well. Um, so I think that it's going to be important um, we're talking about what can governments do, um, but not just, I think we've, we've alluded to multi-stakeholder partnerships, that they, we need to ensure that even in panels like this, that we have representation from governments, because I think that the, t the truth is that our technology is moving quite much, uh, is evolving so much quicker and so much faster than the, uh, the bureaucracy of our governments can. I mean, I think if we can remember the, I think I watched on, on uh, it's TV channel, the, the, um, Mark Zuckerberg and his team uh, making a, a presentation in front of Congress and it was clear that there, was, there are gaps in terms of understanding um, what that company does, what we, you know, the, the functions of the internet. So I think that there is room to, I'm not going to say educate our government because that's condescending, but I think that there is an opportunity to ensure that we are um, keeping our, our public service officers to, up to speed, that perhaps it's creating a new arm of government that is um, really dedicated and focused on ensuring that the learning um, as the technologies are evolving to really start to think about how we improve um, data governance, uh, responsible use of data, and some of the issues that we've allowed. Thank that you. Yeah. So light touch regulation, there's just no way that the regulator can keep up speed with the, with the changing landscape. So light touch and then correct e inefficiencies later on, number one. Number two, as we saw, what, 5.6 billion people are covered with the data network. So 80% of the world's population, yet only half are connected. So why is that? Well, according to our research, it is, and maybe you need to correct me if I'm wrong, is three things. Uh, four things. One is, of course, infrastructure, but that is the little bit. Uh, the big things are skills. I don't know how to use this thing. I think that's reasonably easy to fix. Number two is affordability, and that's where taxation comes in. You know, I need to have enough money to use this thing, and I need to have the skills. But the biggest thing is I have the money, I know how to use it, but there's just nothing there for me. There's no content that is relevant and that's local. If you look at the number of apps being developed, by far, 75, 80% of them are done in the US or Europe, and they're all in English. There's nothing, nothing, there is limited amount that is really relevant for the local population. So innovation, I think, creating an, a benign uh, uh, environment for entrepreneurs, I think is what is needed. So if, if I was an entrepreneur, I was in the audience, I would say, gee, that's a big business idea. There's now in Amman, uh, you know, a cluster that's being formed and creating content in Arabic for, for the Spot web on, and so yeah. on. So, so that's a big business idea. Thank you very much for it. Well, we're now much more enlightened. I hope we're not more scared. I hope we see also opportunities. And so thank you very much for this very interesting panel. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.